even experimentalists are not going to do Okay, now it's on. Okay, now it's thank you. Okay. Okay, so. Okay. Okay. Maybe it will be it will be better. Okay. So this this talk is chiefly based. Okay, the other way around. No, no, not even took. Okay, yeah. It's chiefly based on a relatively recent paper which was published in Optics Letters. So co-authors of this paper are the following people. Yaroslav Kartashov is a very well-known researcher who uh, shares time between the Barcelona and Moscow, uh, some place near Moscow where he works at the Institute for uh, Spectroscopy of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Then another leading co-author is Professor Fan Gui Ye. He's an associate professor at this uh, at the uh, Shanghai Zhao Tong University, which wa is one of the leading research universities in China. And other authors uh, are actually mem members of the group of Professor Fan Gui Ye. Um, OK, so sorry, I jumped in the opposite direction. So this is the structure of the talk. Of course, it will be opened with some introduction. Then I will try to formulate the model. Actually, there will be two related models uh, that will be presented here. Accordingly, the results that are going to be reported will also be structured in the form of two different uh, parts. Actually, we will be talking about the guided uh, wave propagation in some model of uh, optical model with PT symmetry. And it will be natural first to present the results for a single trapped mode in a single waveguide, essentially a wa waveguiding channel. And separately, uh, some results will be also pre presented for the periodic structure in the form of the periodic array of such waveguides. In that case, uh, we will be talking not about a trapped mode, but about a quasi-periodic Bloch mode in the array. Then conclusions will follow. And then if I, I may have several minutes, or in the time slot, I will maybe add some additional results. The point is that actually most interesting findings, which will be reported here, this is a possibility of actually enhancing and strengthening the PT symmetry. So that sometimes it will become uh, sort of indestructible. And uh, therefore, it may be relevant, if I have enough time, to add some other results. The, the, uh, these results will be dealing with a traditional model in the paraxial approximation. However, in that case, the nonlinearity will be added because this main part will be dealing solely with a linear model. And in that case, a, a common feature between the main part of this talk and, and uh, this addendum, if I have enough time for it, it, it will be that in either case, we can find a model in which actually <coughs> the PT symmetry becomes sort of an endless, so that it will never, it's, it's never completely destroyed. Uh, because there is a very well known feature of the PT symmetric models, which was already discussed in many talks given here. This is the, uh, ad, uh, the, the possibility to achieve a particular critical point at which we observe the spontaneous breaking of the PT symmetry. OK. Uh, so now let us proceed to the introduction. OK, the introduction is some uh, rather formal one, actually. This is some words which uh, do not need to be even uh, uh, said here, because actually this, they address uh, some points which are commonly known to this audience, of course. So this is a possibility that uh, one can uh, de develop the concept of the uh, PT symmetry in quantum models, which are based on non-Hermitian Hamiltonians. So there is this well-known review by Professor Bender, which addressed this general topic. And uh, originally, in the, ter in the framework of the quantum theory per se, it appeared as a sort of a purely theoretical topic. But then uh, the ideas were proposed how to implement this uh, concept of the PT symmetry in experimentally available 
uh, settings using uh, optics. Uh, actually, as far as I know, for the, fir for the first time, the possibility to implement the PT uh, symmetric settings in terms of the propagation of uh, electromagnetic uh, waves in optical waveguides was proposed in 2005 in this paper uh, by uh, Gonzago Muga, Muga and his co-authors. And later, of course, it, it was also developed in detail in many other papers and eventually also it was implemented, exper demonstrated experimentally, as is well known. So it's also well known why uh, this concept can be implemented successfully uh, in experimentally available settings in optics. And the point is commonly known, and actually was mentioned here many times, is the fact that in the quantum theory, the PT symmetric models are usually based on the Schrodinger equation, linear Schrodinger equation, first of all, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, PT symmetric complex potentials, which includes the real and imaginary part, so that the imaginary part will be spatially odd with uh, separated and mutually balanced gain and loss. Okay, and then on the other hand, uh, the in the paraxial approximation, the propagation of electromagnetic waves in optical waveguides is governed by essentially the same equation, although which has a purely classical origin, is de derived not from any quantum theory, it's derived, of course, from the Maxwell's equations, but nevertheless, eventually the form of the equation is essentially the same Schrodinger equation, uh, and in which, which also may cont easily contain the complex potential, and it's, uh, once again, it's real and imaginary parts can represent uh, gain and loss elements inserted into this optical waveguide. So this, all, of course, is commonly known to everyone in this room. Okay, <coughs> and uh, uh, what should be stressed in, in the context of this talk is the fact that this derivation of the effective Schrodinger-like propagation equation from the Maxwell's equation in terms of optics is based so this is a, this is a form of this equation, which for uh, generally may, in, in terms of optics, it may also is also commonly known, include the additional nonlinear term, which is generated in terms of optics by the Kerr effect. So it may be, uh, in terms of the sign of the nonlinearity, it may be the self-defocusing or self-focusing, which would be more natural to optics, sign of the nonlinearity. So U is the a real part of this effective potential, which actually in optics is induced by creating the necessary spatially even profile of the refractive index, as it's commonly known. So this is the imaginary part, which is induced, as I mentioned, that is also commonly known to everyone here, by the symmetrically placed gain and loss elements, so that globally they compensate each other, they, they are subject to the balance. Okay, this is formally written here. So this is written for the one-dimensional setting. Psi is a propagation coordinate in optics, and eta is a transverse coordinate. Okay, so the essential fact is that this, uh, uh, what's called parabolic or Schrodinger-like propagation equation is derived from Maxwell's equations in the paraxial approximation. And the paraxial approximation implies that if we have some characteristic spatial scale of these potentials, its, uh, its size should be much larger than the wavelengths of light. Then the diffraction of light will be described in the normalized form, of course, by this simple operator. Okay. <coughs> and uh, now, before we proceed further, let us also maybe it's relevant to mention also that this uh, model, which is relevant to optics, was also a subject of many of the theoretical analysis is a large number of works. In particular, when the nonlinearity is taken into regard, uh, various types of nonlinear modes in the form of spatial solitons were considered in this type of the PT symmetric nonlinear model. And usually in this analysis of solitons, what is most challenging is not a problem of finding stationary solitons because in some cases it, they can be exactly the same 
as in the respective traditional models and conservative models without loss and gain because in some cases a solid is a sol solution for the solid one may be found in the, in the form which would be ex completely tantamount to its counterpart is the conservative model but a more challenging problem is usually the analysis of the stability of such solitons, which may be completely different from uh, the stability of the conservative counterparts, even if the formal shape of the solitons is the same. Um, <coughs> okay, so this is references to some works. It's actually, of course, the, the list is definitely incomplete, where uh, all, this, all works are theoretical, and in all these works, people tried to analyze various properties of spatial solitons in nonlinear models with a linear PT symmetry. Um, okay, so uh, as concerns this, uh, this problem of the stability, it can be very easily illustrated if we look at this uh, quite simple model with the PT symmetry, which has its physical meaning in optics. This is the model of the coupler, so what we consider a dual core waveguide. Uh, assuming that uh, each, each core, where we have the amplitudes of the electromagnetic fields U and V, it carries the kernel linearity with, which, with a sign which we may would like to consider. It may be self-focusing or self-defocusing. Then there is this pair of terms, as usual, accounts for the linear coupling between the cores, for the fact that light can linearly, uh, photons, roughly speaking, may jump between the cores across the dielectric barrier which separates it, and then eventually we have this pair of terms with some real coefficient beta, which accounts for the uh, balanced gain and loss, so that in this particular, if beta is positive, in this particular notation, we assume that the first core carries a uniform gain, and the second core carries the uniform loss with exactly the same coefficient. Okay, so here, is, this is an example of the model where solitons can be found, symmetric solitons with equal components, I mean, uh, uh, proportional components, let's say. There may be phase shift, shift, phase shift between them in U and V. So essentially, these solitons will be exactly the same as well-known soliton solutions in the conservative version of this coupler. However, the stability conditions for these solitons will be quite different from what is known for the conservative coupler because of the presence of the gain and loss. And one uh, ele elementary fact, which is immediately obvious, is that even if we, uh, if we, d if we forget about the nonlinearity and solitons and just look at the stability of the zero, trivial zero solution, it's obvious that it will be stable as long as uh, uh, this common gain loss coefficient beta is smaller than the coupling coefficient. Uh, when we attain the point when beta becomes equal to coupling, this is actually exactly the point of the spontaneous breaking of the PT symmetry in the linearized version of the system, and then the same essentially determines uh, effects, not, not exactly, the, but it's the same, it's the same fact if affects the stability of more sophisticated solutions such as solitons in this coupler. Okay, so this was still sort of an introduction. Now let us proceed to our model. The, the model will be very different from what I showed right now, and the problem that we would like to consider here is also different. So uh, all these models, which uh, were discussed briefly here and which were written in dozens, if not hundreds of works, they were derived, as I already tried to stress, from the, essentially from the Maxwell's equations using the paraxial approximation. And therefore, they, the derivation would end up with this Schrodinger-like equation, or maybe a system of coupled Schrodinger-like equations, as in the last example. However, uh, the modern development of sub-wavelengths optics, or in other words, this is something which is called nanophotonics, <coughs> makes it possible, not only theoretically, but in the real experiment, to create uh, uh, diverse uh, experimentally available settings in which light is essentially confined to the sub-wavelength scale of the pr propagation in the transverse direction. So it's possible to couple the incident beam of light into, roughly speaking, into a waveguide whose width will be essentially smaller than the wavelengths of light. So this, in this sub-wavelength regime, uh, the derivation, the paraxial approximation becomes completely irrelevant. 
And then, uh, in principle, the propagation of light must be described using the full system of the Maxwell's equations, which, of course, is more uh, generally it's more cumbersome than using the simple uh, Schrodinger-like equation. But it's not something impossible. It can be done. And then this suggests a, na a rather natural question. OK, if we start from the <coughs> optical setting, let it be just a purely linear one, in which we introduce this concept of the um, PT symmetry. So we assume that we have the gain and loss elements placed symmetrically so that they globally are in balance. But then we would like to consider all this setting in the sub-wavelength regime. So for example, the effective size of these elements will be essentially smaller than the wavelengths of light. And then the uh, natural question will be, what will happen with the propagation of light in this PT symmetric setting if we proceed, f if we g give up the simple parabolic-like uh, paraxial approximation and try to use the full system of the Maxwell's equation. Of course, still in the purely classical form. We are not going to, uh, to say a single word about any quantum effect. OK, so this is the subject of our analysis, which we recently published in the paper which I mentioned. And then uh, there is an, some additional incentive to consider this. Uh, recently, some theoretic, other theoretical works suggested to implement the PT symmetry in artificial meter materials, so materials which uh, give rise to the effectively negative refractive index. Uh, in that case, actually, still, the, in this, uh, this was theoretical works. In this theoretical works, still, the analysis essentially was performed in the framework of the paraxial approximation. However, it's very, very well known, it was m maybe mentioned in a couple of talks already given here, that the structural elements which are used to assemble emitter material by themselves are always so have sub-wavelength sub sizes. And this is an additional sort of an indirect incentive to consider the uh, possibility to extend or an analyze what will happen to the, PT, is the concept of the PT symmetry in optics uh, beyond the f uh, limits of the paraxial approximation. So at the true sub-wavelength scale. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, so actually, in any case, this is not the subject of my talk. I just wanted to give a reference. Is this, uh, these works are not mine. I just wanted to mention that people did it. <laughs> yes, okay, of course, yeah, but okay, okay. These were purely theoretical papers where people suggested to somehow implement PT symmetry in meter materials. Then I, uh, I'm not responsible for the vali validity of these attempts. I just wanted to mention that some other people did it. <laughs> no, okay. The, I just wanted to say that there is some reference which is indirectly related to the topic, but I'm not going to actually consider it. Who Who, whose name? Ah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's. Okay. So now uh, 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 we would like now to analyze the model, which, will, as I mentioned already a couple of times, it will be a purely linear one in which we will try to implement the, what is traditionally uh, assumed about the PT symmetric setting in optics, but this time without using, as I also stressed several times, without using the paraxial approximation, without using the no Schrodinger-like equation, but using the full system of the Maxwell's equation. So to be uh, more, uh, more, but uh, more, uh, to, 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 to consider the particular configuration, we cannot, of course, consider the more general case. So we here concentrate on the particular case of the TM, transverse magnetic polarized uh, optical wave, which means that it has, in this, uh, we consider the stationary form of the Maxwell equations. Stationary means that we assume that we have a strictly, in terms of the frequency, we have a strictly monochromatic wave with a single carrier frequency omega. And we are going to write the particular form of the Maxwell's equations when the field depends on the propagation coordinate z and on the single transverse coordinate x, so that effectively we have the one something which may be called as a one-dimensional system. And this is definitely it's not the most generic one, because generic would have two transverse coordinates. We consider here only the case of the single transverse coordinate. OK, then if it is a TM polarized wave, so it, it's commonly known that this wave has three 
non-zero components of the strengths of the electric and magnetic fields. Namely, there is a single magnetic component, HY, which is perpendicular to the propagation direction. Then there is, of course, the, an, uh, uh, also a perpendicular component of the electric field, perpendicular both to the propagation direction and to its magnetic counterpart, E sub X. And then, if we exactly uh, want to define the transverse magnetic field, the electric field, generally speaking, has a non-vanishing longitudinal component, E sub Z. So we have three components. And then after looking at the Maxwell's equations in this... Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's a call from Maxwell, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so let's come back to this uh, talk. So, okay, so uh, wh what can be derived from the Maxwell's equation in the setting, once again, pr uh, assuming that we have a purely linear medium, is a system of two equations which are written here. So these are two equations <coughs> for two components, E sub X and H sub Y, two transverse components actually of the electric and magnetic field, then we should still have a third equation for the longitudinal uh, component of the electric field, which is very simple. It's written here, it just really actually expresses the uh, longitudinal component in terms of the derivative of the transverse magnetic component. Now, as concerned how we introduce the PT symmetry in the spirit of optics, Okay, okay. We are essentially the same way as it was traditionally introduced in the framework of models which uh, relied upon the paraxial approximation, uh, with some difference, of course. The difference is that usually uh, uh, in those models, people introduce the complex potential with the uh, real and imaginary parts. Here, instead, we introduce uh, the complex distribution, transverse distribution, uh, of the complex uh, dielectric permittivity. The magnetic permeability is fixed to be one, so we can see the non-magnetic medium, but we assume that the dielectric per per permittivity uh, has this constant background value, and then on top of it we have two uh, kinds of the spatial modulation. We have the spatially even uh, real part, uh, uh, spatially dependent real part of the permittivity, and additionally a spatially odd imaginary part of the permittivity. Uh, then, uh, as concerns the physical parameters, in all this numerical analysis, we will fix that the carrier wavelengths uh, take this particular value. It corresponds to the visible red light. Uh, sorry? Ah, uh, maybe exactly this one. So, so frankly, I don't remember ex exactly what kind of laser can produce this signal. Uh, yeah, but not, not, this, not green, not green, not, not corresponding to this color, actually. Eager had actually a red uh, pointer, maybe it's, it's, it's closer. Yeah, okay, yeah. And then uh, we take this uh, fixed value of the back constant background permittivity. It's more or less corresponds, roughly speaking, to silica. Okay, then as concerns this non-trivial, non-trivial uh, modulated parts, we will consider two types of models. One is written here. So what you can see in terms of, it's, uh, in, uh, you can see that this is uh, exactly corresponds to the single channel, to single wave guiding channel, because this is like, rough, roughly speaking, is a trapping, uh, plays the role of the trapping potential, and this is its spatially odd imaginary counterpart. Or uh, we will also consider a periodic structure, in which case we have both the periodic modulation of the real part of the primitivity and its counterpart in the form of the spatially odd periodic modulation of the imaginary part. Epsilon depends also on the frequency, on omega, right? Oh yeah, but omega is fixed once and forever. Actually, it's fixed according to this lambda, essentially. So that, therefore, we do not explicitly consider this dependence. But, but in principle, yes. In principle, it depends. You cannot arbitrarily choose real and imaginary part. They oh. are well, in principle, yes, but, okay, in principle, yes, but still, uh, well, this is, is somehow hidden in these two free parameters. One is P, the P is the amplitude, is here or here, is the amplitude of the modulation of the real part, and alpha is another essential parameter, it's simultaneously the amplitude of the modulation, spatial modulation of the imaginary part, which is odd, and then the third essential parameter is D. 
So in any case, this is something which is going to, to be sub-wavelengths. It's either the width of the single channel or the periodicity of the array. It's a spatial, a characteristic spatial scale. So that we will be interested essentially on the dependence of the uh, different modes that we are, are going to find here, uh, uh, varying these three essential parameters, the amplitude of the real modulation, the amplitude of the imaginary modulation, and the characteristic transverse spatial scale D. Uh, p is alpha square. No, when p is alpha square, none, nothing essential happens. But sometimes, You're no. Yeah, sometimes some so we will see something happens sometimes when p is equal to alpha. Essentially, yeah. it's something. It's actually we will see that sometimes we can see the uh, uh, the paraxial limit from this result. In that case, it will be a characteristic. Oh, yeah. Point, yeah, but uh, is, is in, in the in the case of when d is large enough and we get back to the paraxial limit, we will see this here. Okay, uh, so as I said, they usually used effective and uh, in the parax when people use effective paraxial uh, effective potential in the paraxial approximation, which is also complex. So this is actually the real and imaginary part of the refract refractive index, and they are related to the complex. Um, uh, distribution of the permittivity according to this obvious relation. Now, what we would like to find from the solution, first of all, we would like to find stationary solutions, which means the following. We can look at these two transverse components because the longitudinal component is easily expressed in terms of them. And we would like to find some sp transverse profiles of these two transverse components, as functions of x times. This uh, factor, which means that we have the constant propagation, co uh, the, uh, perm the we want to find this mode with the constant propagation, with the propagation constant b, with the propagation constant b, and then this b plays the essential role. It's like the eigenvalue, which determines if you do or do not have the um, the, the conserved PT symmetry, and so that we will have three possibilities in principle. We will really see it. Uh, so b may be generally speaking, of course, complex. So if it's really complex and if it has non-zero imaginary part, it means essentially that this can be considered in the framework of this sub-wavelength description as a situation with the broken PT symmetry because this mode uh, as a, is the cause of the propagation will be exponentially growing, exponentially decaying, but will not be kept permanent. On the other hand, we will see that sometimes we can find a class of such modes when B is purely real. This is something which may be interpreted quite naturally as the case of the uh, supported uh, PT symmetry, unbroken symmetry. And eventually we will have a certain uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, um, zero uh, possibility when we, s for example, when we want to consider the trapped mode in the single channel, we will simply have no uh, trapped mode at all, neither uh, with uh, complex B nor with uh, real B. So, uh, the only solutions will be available in the form of delocalized modes, in which case we consider that we simply don't have any trapped mode at all. Now, uh, okay, so uh, generally what should be also added here, uh, it's once again the sort of a motivation, the link to the underlying uh, class of quantum models in which the uh, concept of the PT symmetry originated. So that, as I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned already, it is commonly known as uh, a consideration of all these settings in optics was strongly motivated by the possibility to, to experimentally implement the same type of the Schrodinger equation, which is considered in the quantum series. Here, of course, the situation is completely different. We don't have anything like the Schrodinger equation. We have the system of Maxwell's equations. So uh, this uh, mo uh, this model has no direct link to the uh, uh, to the quantum theory of uh, with the PT symmetry. It's, but it's obviously interesting in optics, so to say per se, for in optics uh, by itself, because this is a more accurate description of the this type of, of settings in optics in the case when we can push. As uh, a setting into the sub wavelengths regime, which is strongly suggested by the currently current experimental development of nanophotonics. And therefore, this is a uh, rather natural motivation to analyze this model, even though we don't have a direct link to the more abstract, so to say, quantum models. Uh, just to be sure, uh, 
this BTC with three in itself is guaranteed without regardless of the Schrodinger equation. Uh. Any equation, wave equation, uh -huh. Maxwell, Helmholtz. If you have PT symmetry, you are guaranteed that you have either real spectrum or or uh, complex, complex spectrum. spectrum. Or sometimes, as I mentioned, we may have nothing. In the case when we don't have. In this sense, it's not <coughs> the same. Well, yeah, but I mean, I mean, the uh, type of the model is very different from what people consider in the uh, quantum models because we have nothing like the Schrodinger equation. Right, but you consider also wave equations. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. But okay. I just want. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say that there is no uh, straightforward uh, similar similarity between uh, between this and the uh, situation in more abstract, so to say, quantum models. Uh, I guess a, the point is quite clear. Okay, so now let's proceed to the present presentation of results. The result, results were obtained from the numerical solutions of the linear equations because, of course, they are too difficult for the analytical solution. So first of all, let us look at the situation for the single waveguide whose width is taken in the sub-wavelengths region. And we let us look at uh, results for the trapped modes. So here f f we start with the case when the <coughs> width of this channel is 120 nanometers. Let me remind that we fix this uh, carrier wave uh, wavelength, so the, red, the, the one for the red light. And so this is already a sub-wavelength uh, size, but still it's not very deeply sub-wavelength in a sense. It's uh, uh, so, sort of a moderately sub-wavelength. So in this case, we can have some set, p typical set of numerical results. So what we can do here, we fix a particular value of the amplitude of this, actually essentially the depth of this uh, channel. And now doing this, we as a free parameter, we vary the amplitude of the imaginary part of the primitivity sort of a, a gain loss coefficient. In this case, we have the situation which is qualitatively quite similar to what was known in the paraxial approximation. Namely, as we fix two, uh, these two parameters D and P, and we keep increasing alpha starting from zero from the conservative model, we up to this critical value of alpha, we do have the, uh, the zero, uh, BI means the imaginary part of the propagation constant we have the purely real eigenvalue. Uh, and at this point, we have the bifurcation, uh, which means, as a matter of fact, the spontaneous breaking of the PT symmetry, because past this point, we have already only the complex propagation, co complex propagation constants for the uh, trapped modes. Uh, <coughs> so this can be also illustrated, uh, well, we'll say it a little bit later, but now, so, so, okay, so this, this result for the moderately sub-wavelength sub setting is uh, different, of course, in details from its uh, uh, paraxial counterpart, but qualitatively it's quite similar. However, let's now go to still deeper wavelength region, and we take uh, this time uh, uh, the uh, channel, the width of the channel, which is half of which we had in the previous case. 60 nanometers is already one-tenth, roughly speaking, of the wavelengths. In that case, the situation becomes quite different. So what we see is shown here. So the first, the first of all, we still have the spontaneous symmetry breaking and this critical value of alpha, of the amplitude of the imaginary part. However, first of all, uh, this value, this critical value is essentially larger than in the previous case. Then the largest imaginary part of, of the propagation constant that we can have here is much smaller than before. Here you see that to show it, it was necessary to artificially multiply it by a factor of 30, otherwise it would be too small to show in the plot. And then the most essential uh, novelty, which is something really, really novel in this case, if we keep increasing alpha, we have the inverse bifurcation inverse bifurcation, we have the spontaneous restoration of the PT symmetry. So when uh, this common gain loss coefficient, roughly speaking, uh, uh, passes this inter in instability interval and keeps increasing, we come back to the situation when the imaginary part of the propagation constant is exactly zero, and we still and we again have a trapped modes with a purely real propagation constant, which shows that those which again feature the, the unbroken PT symmetry. So this restoration is sort of a new result. Can I ask you, when, you, when you go, if you were to just look at this in a laboratory, yeah. would you see a qualitative difference between one unbroken region and the other? Uh, let us look. It, it will, it will be show, some example will be shown. Okay, we will, we will see something about that. Uh, no. question. Uh, yeah. You, your BR, does it have a kink 
in the place where the B I becomes uh, bifurcated? Oh, sorry. You mean uh, the real is here? Yeah. Well, well we can, here we have some bifurcations. There where we have some uh, sort of a change in this uh, slope. And otherwise, B R is just a single value of B R. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, of course. Well, well uh, uh, yeah. You you have. Strictly speaking, plus minus BR, of course, because you have propagation to the left or to the right. Right, right. So it's not like two BRs becoming degenerate and the BI is developing. Yeah, okay. Well, this is exactly what is shown here. Yeah, okay. Okay, now uh, what also uh, can be uh, interesting to look at as a particular examples of the spatial profiles of these trapped modes. So this is the situation when we are still in the region of the unbroken PT symmetry when alpha is below the first critical value. So what we see in this case, all the modes uh, feature an obvious spatial symmetry. That is, the real parts are even functions of x, and the imaginary parts of the, the, of the strengths are um, odd uh, and anti-symmetric functions of x. Okay, and on the other hand, if we go now to the region of the broken PT symmetry, when we have the complex propagation constant, oops, ah, it's okay, so, sorry. It's, no, it's okay, just an as additional illustration. Still, before we saw other examples, uh, our, uh, this, these solutions are solutions of the actually ordinary differential equations for stationary modes, but we started from the partial differential equations where we have the evolution in Z, spatial evolution in Z, and the dependence on X. So that in that case, we can also solve explicitly these partial differential equations just to make it sure that indeed the propagation is stable. And so it's, as is illustrated here, we, t we take the mode with unbroken PT symmetry, and this should be expected. Actually, the result is, in a sense, uh, trivial, of course. It propagates in the stable shape. Okay, now, on the other hand, if we look at the shape of this mode with the broken PT symmetry, not only the PT symmetry is broken, but also the spatial symmetry, the symmetry of this mode is also broken. So you see that we simply, uh, the system breaks the spatial symmetry of these unstable modes. On the other hand, okay, this is an illustration of the, for the direct simulation of the propagation. Naturally, we have either the blow up or the decay because we have the uh, non-zero imaginary part of the propagation constant. Okay, now uh, we can look at this most challenge, most interesting region when we have the restoration of the PT symmetry when alpha becomes larger than the second critical value, where we have the inverse bifurcation, the restoration of the PT symmetry. In that case, we uh, also, what is automatically restored is the spatial symmetry of the trapped modes. The difference from what we had before is that if you carefully consider this um, um, profiles, which was what was shown several minutes ago, th there are two conclusions. One is that now these modes are much more narrow than they used to be. So they are really very, very deeply sub-wavelength modes. The second difference is that uh, looking at the, comparing the longitudinal and transverse comp uh, components of the electric field, we see that in this deeply sub-wavelength region, they become quite comparable. The amplitudes become al almost equal. So it's uh, no longer true that the longitudinal component is much smaller than its transverse counterpart. This is illustration that is quite obvious uh, plot that if we have the restoration of the PT symmetry, then we have the restoration of the stable propagation. Mm. Okay, now uh, the next result. Let us keep decreasing the uh, width of this trapping channel. Now we still, we take it, uh, we decrease it by another factor of two. So it's now roughly speaking one twentieth of the wavelengths. What we have in this case, we have now the endless PT symmetry. No breaking takes place at all. So as at least in this interval of alpha, as, as for values of alpha as large as we, could, as we took in the calculations, uh, the imaginary part always remained equal to zero, and the, the propagation constant was purely real. So that we had a sort of a unbreakable PT symmetry in this very deeply, extremely deeply, sub-wavelength regime. So that uh, roughly speaking, the, we will proceed from the paraxial approximation to the deeply sub-wavelength regime. The result is that for some reason, which I cannot explain in simple terms, uh, the PT symmetry tends to become much more robust than it used to be. Can I just ask you yeah. Um, you've done this with P-held fix. Yes. Now, I think there was a comment earlier that alpha and P are not complete. 
completely independent. Uh, so that this study is how P fixed and that alpha very separate. Okay, we we will see some plot about this a little bit a little bit later, okay? Uh, what is intuitively obvious? Um, take alpha extremely large. Yeah. Then that's the largest term in the equation. Yeah. Throw out everything. You have one amplifier, the mm -hmm. other. Okay, we, we, we will see some plot which uh, shows this, illustrates this, this, this feature, okay? Now, okay, this is a plot which illustrates what happens. So this is uh, the following uh, stability diagram. So this, uh, we fix here, uh, uh, we fix here P. So there are two different uh, uh, plots. This is what may be called a weak, weak, uh, weak uh, channel, and this is a strong channel. So shallow channel with small value of p, and a, a strong, uh, deeper channel with a larger value of p. Now, uh, uh, varying parameters are this uh, coefficient of the strength of the imaginary part and the subwave at this uh, spatial scale. So first, if, first, if you look at large value of d, what we see, ah, okay, what is shown, sorry. One is the area where we have the broken PT symmetry. Three is the area where we have the unbroken PT symmetry, I mean, uh, trapped modes with a purely real propagation constant. And this region two is the one where we cannot find any, even formally, cannot find any trapped mode. Neither uh, with broken nor with unbro unbroken symmetry. Okay, so first of all, one feature which is quite obvious here at large d, large d means that we eventually essentially get back to the paraxial limit. Here we have this horizontal, I'm sorry, I'm sorry horizontal region between the broken and unbroken symmetry, which means actually it's e very easy to see that this constant value simply corresponds to alpha equal to p, either here or here, and this will be uh, exactly the boundary between the broken and unbroken pt symmetry in the respective um, um, uh, um, paraxial limit. But now when we look at the deeply subwavelength region, what we see here, at very small values of d, up to this, at least let's say, up to this interval of uh, alpha which we studied, we see no symmetry breaking at all, PTC. Maybe, who knows, because here we have some very s weak slope of this boundary, maybe it will uh, ever uh, uh, come, uh, intersect this vertical axis, which we, because the uh, numerical data were c c uh, collected up to, this, uh, up to this point. But up to this point, we have this sort of a effectively endless PT symmetry, which is never broken. And what I showed before actually, I mean, the breaking and restoration of the PT symmetry actually corresponds to this particular, sorry, corresponds to this particular case when P is 1.7, and this is actually the value of D was something like, uh, at this point, so here we see, if we increase, keep increasing alpha, we have first the breaking of the PT symmetry, and roughly speaking, at this point, it was restored. And this is what we observed. Okay, now, briefly, because time is going out, uh, some results for the periodic uh, array of waveguides, when we want to find, instead of the trapped mode, the block modes. So the block modes, for example, in terms of the transverse magnetic field, I defined here, so we have the propagation constant again. Now we have this index n, which means the number of the uh, brilliant zone, because we, uh, or the number of the band. We may have different bands in this periodic system. So k is the block wave vector, which determines the quasi-periodicity of this mode. And as a function h, it's, uh, h of x is considered to be uh, completely periodic. It's the same periodicity as the uh, uh, underlying array. Okay, and so what happens in this case, uh, roughly speaking, can be summarized as, follow, as, f as follows. First, if we take rather small value of alpha here, 0.6, uh, we have two bands in this particular calculation. In both bands, the uh, propagation constants are purely real, and therefore we have this unbro the unbroken uh, PT symmetry this time for the blo block waves. On the other hand, we take here is alpha, which is 10 times larger, 6.0 instead of 0.6. And so what happens here, uh, we see the following, that in this region, we have actually the merger of two bands into one. Uh, this gap between them uh, disappears, and when they merge, they become complex, I mean, the eigenvalues. And so here we have the breaking of the PT symmetry. Then we have some... Uh, other reason where we have the, so we have here the mixed situation. 
here the PT symmetry is broken, here the PT symmetry still holds, but uh, as a, uh, we cannot claim here that the PT symmetry is completely conserved, it's partly broken. And uh, this is the illustration of the direct propagation, so this here we pick up the stable case when we have the unbroken PT symmetry, so this periodic wave, or quasi-periodic waves propagate stably. Here is, for example, the case when we have the non-zero imaginary part of the propagation constant. Uh, okay, now what's also interesting, if we keep increasing alpha, we have a, um, a phenomenon which is qualitatively similar to what I already mentioned before in the case of a single channel. We may have the restoration of the PT symmetry here. So we take now value, the same parameters, but now alpha essentially larger than before, 14.2. Uh, previously, when we had the partial symmetry breaking, it was 6. Now it's uh, larger by a factor of roughly 2.5 than before. And now we have the restoration of the uh, two bands, which are separated by the gap, and p uh, with purely real propagation constant. And therefore, here, the, all the modes are stable, with, uh, featuring the unbroken PT symmetry. This is another illustration of this. Actually, we keep increasing alpha here. So this point, 14.2 was somewhere here. So up to this point, we start already from large value of, of alpha. The single uh, uh, line means that we have the uh, no, no band, no, no gap, excuse me, the zero gap, which means that here we have at least par partially broken PT symmetry. Here we have the restoration of the gap between two bands, which implies that in this interval, we have the restoration of the full PT symmetry, but keeping increasing alpha, we again have the new point of the symmetry breaking. Here again, the gap collapses. And here again, at least the part of the modes will acquire the imaginary part of the propagation constant and will become unstable. And so this is, once again, the illustration of the stable propagation in, of the restored, in the case of the restored PT symmetry. Okay, what's more interesting here is this diagram which, sim which summarizes the results. So what is shown here, first of all, this is again alpha, but shown as a logarithmic scale. This is D, so this qualitatively similar diagram to the one which I already showed, but now, um, and, uh, so the notation is like this. We have only two types of regions, one and three. One is the region where at least partly the PT symmetry is broken, and three here it is the initially unbroken PT symmetry, here is fully restored PT symmetry. So here you can observe what I mentioned before. If we keep increasing alpha, here we have the restoration of the full PT symmetry, and then again it can be broken, and then if we, if we have a chance to continue this plot, probably we may have more regions of the uh, breakup and restoration of the PT symmetry. Here, it's it really, it's not known what happens at still larger values of alpha. Maybe the picture will be rather complex. <coughs> okay, so conclusions of this are the rather obvious. So if we proceed from the traditional paraxial approximation adopted in optics in the purely linear setting and in the effectively one-dimensional uh, uh, type of the geometry to the, <coughs> excuse me, proceed to the full sub-wavelength theory based on the Maxwell's equations, in particular for the transverse magnetic waves. This is what we really considered. For in, we considered two types of uh, the wave guiding structures, either the single channel or periodic array. Essentially what happens is that unlike the Paraxial uh, setting here, the increase of this common gain loss coefficient gives rise, generally speaking, to the restoration of the PT symmetry. And the, this effect is quite strong in the case of the single channel. And also, it manifests itself, but maybe in a complex form, with both uh, with alternating uh, uh, breakup and restoration, and again, breakup of the PT symmetry for the block modes in the periodic array. Uh, <coughs> and then actually, at least as concerns the case of the single channel, we could see that up to the uh, parametric region where results were collected, we see something which seems like an endless region of the PT symmetry where uh, up to the value of alpha which was considered, we never observe, is a very deeply sub wavelength region, never observe any breaking of the PT symmetry, it seems to be completely robust. <laughs> okay, now in uh, obvious di directions to extend this analysis are two. First of all, it's maybe quite interesting to, to add the nonlinearity and see what will happen. And the other direction, of course, it all this uh, analysis was one-dimensional. 
it's maybe interesting to extend it to two dimensions, so to add the additional transverse coordinate. And then on top of all that, of course, this is, was done only for the transverse magnetic uh, uh, waves. It may be interesting to, to, to extend this for, uh, let's say, for the transverse electric waves as well. Now, if I have maybe five minutes, uh, let me make some ad ad addendum, as I said. So here is the most interesting result of this analysis is that we may have some examples of what seems to be as an unbreakable PT symmetry. And therefore, I would like to mention some, a completely different model, this time paraxial and nonlinear, where nevertheless a similar effect is observed. Namely, we can predict sort of a unbreakable PT symmetry too, but in a completely different setting. So let me just very briefly mention this. So this was published also relatively recently. One co-author is the same as the previous work, Yaroslav Kartashov. And you, Louis Turner is a director of this famous Institute of Photonic Studies in Barcelona, or in the suburb of Barcelona. OK, and now this type, this type of the model is written here. So it's a paraxial approximation. As I said, it's, we don't consider here anything suburb lengths uh, for the amplitude of the, of the wave. Uh, now the model may be, actually it will be one dimensional essentially. Uh, the nonlinearity, now we can take the nonlinear model, so nonlinearity will be purely self defocusing, sigma is positive. Uh, but, and we would like to consider this time solitons, how we can have solitons as a case of the purely, 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 uh, purely self defocusing nonlinearity. We assume that sigma as a function, this nonlinearity coefficient as a function of the transverse coordinate grows from the center to periphery, so that also the nonlinearity is everywhere um, uh, self-defocusing. Nevertheless, self-trapping is quite possible in the region where we have the minimum of the self-defocusing. OK, so this, this type of the model was introduced in a series of works. But all, all these works, uh, the model was purely conservative, without any PT uh, part. Uh, now, how it works, uh, we, take, we can look at the one-dimensional model for simplicity. This is a stationary kind of the equation. Then it's very easy to understand the situation. In the Thomas Fermi approximation, we can simply drop the second derivative, obtain this approximate analytical solution, and then if we demand the, uh, we demand the, norm, uh, the, the mode to be normalizable, to the norm to converge, what we see is the fact that very, the result is very simple. If we have the d-dimensional space, not necessarily one-dimensional, this self-trapping mechanism will, will create uh, finite, mo finite uh, norm uh, solutions, provided that sigma grows from the center to periphery at any rate faster than distance from the center to the power, which is exactly equal to the dimension of space. So in one-dimensional case, it simply should grow faster than the absolute value of the coordinate. Now, if we want eventually to introduce the PT version of this, we don't introduce any uh, even um, uh, real potential because, we, as a matter of fact, we already have sort of a nonlinear uh, even potential, sort of, or sometimes people call it pseudo potential. But we, of course, we add explicitly the, uh, we explicitly add the uh, linear uh, imaginary part of the potential here. And then this is a PT version of that system that we would like to consider. So here, this is a particular shape, particular form of the model with a very steep modulation, simply because it's not necessary, but the results seem actually can be presented in a very compact form in this case. So this is the shape of the modulation. This is the modulation of the local self strength of the self defocusing. And this is the usual imaginary part of the linear potential, which accounts for the PT symmetry per se, okay. And then we proceed with the analysis. And okay, so because I don't have much time, let me just uh, formulate a couple of results. So in this case, as a one dimensional model, we can find many different solitons. We can find uh, fundamental solitons uh, shown here. We can find dipole modes. And then we can find tri tripole modes and eventually four pole or quadrupole modes here. Both the ground state uh, soliton and the excited versions. All of them may be st easily stable. And then uh, in one particular solution for the ground state can be found, ground state soliton can be found in the exact analytical form for one particular value of the propagation constant. What's interesting here, if you look at the propagation constant, beta is the coefficient of the imaginary, in front of the imaginary uh, potential. We see that it exists for arbitrarily, this exact solution exists in the well-defined form for the arbitrarily large value of, the, of this gain loss coefficient, which implies that we will have sort of an endless PT symmetry in this model too. 
Okay, and then actually what happens here is we keep increasing its numerical form, as we keep increasing this common coefficient of the gain and loss, is the following result. Here we can fix the propagation constant. As we fix the propagation constant, what happens actually, this is plots which are similar to some which were particularly displayed in the talk of Professor Bender. Here we have the merger and annihilation different branches. So this is a branch of the dipole modes and this is a branch of the fundamental solitons. If we fix the propagation constant, they really disappear at some critical value of beta. In that sense, this is the disappearance of the PT symmetry because solutions do not exist here. And another ex example of this, we have also a similar merger of tripole and quadrupole modes. Here, these modes are completely stable before they disappear. Here, they are partly stable, partly unstable. Okay, but what, uh, in what sense we can have the unbreakable PT symmetry here is shown by this last plot. Also, it was uh, suggested by the analytical solution, which I demonstrated. Namely, we uh, can actually in gradually increase the absolute value of the propagation constant, and we look at the critical value of this gain-loss coefficient at which we have the merger and disappearance of different branches. So as we see, as we increase the absolute value of B, this crit both critical values, they go to infinity, which means that if we, if we t have ex extremely la large values of the gain and loss coefficient, but we always have stable solitons with sufficiently large absolute values of the propagation constant. In this sense, somehow it may be sa we may say that this is a model which gives rise to the family of PT symmetric solitons, which are in, a, in that sense unbreakable. Okay, so this is actually this conclusion which I already formulated in words here. And so this is sort of a qualitative similarity between this nonlinear paraxial model and that um, sub wavelengths linear model which I reported in the main part of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh -huh. amount of gain or loss, and the second is the coupling between the two regions. Yes. And, uh, and then if alpha is larger than the coupling, then, then this position is broken. If alpha is smaller, then yeah. it's not. So my question is again about this endless, what is the, your parameter? What is the coupling? Uh, there, uh, okay. there cannot be any endless uh, uh, PT yeah, so okay. If alpha is sufficiently large, you will always go into Okay, so uh, in, in this uh, sub-wavelength model, uh, actually this uh, coupling was essentially, it was not exactly coupling, but no. simul qualitatively the role of coupling was played by that parameter P, the amplitude of the real part of the primitivity. And so what we could see up to the region for what numerical data were uh, was collected, when alpha was essentially uh, larger than P, but simultaneously we had a strongly sub-wavelength region, we didn't have the, sy the symmetry breaking. Uh, I cannot give an exact uh, uh, reply to the question, but maybe if we try to analyze it uh, carefully, maybe the somehow the effective coupling will be this P divided by some power of the, of the uh, spatial scale of D. Maybe for this reason, it becomes essentially larger, but this is just a speculative assumption at this moment. As I mentioned before, uh, we have these numerical results for that sub wavelength model, but we unfortunately we cannot come up with a simple f explanation of why these effects do happen. Okay, can, uh, can I make a mm -hmm. I mean, When you have the breaking of PT symmetry, what is happening is that eigenvalues are merging, mm -hmm. coming together. But it is possible to have a parameter like a gain loss parameter, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but the eigenvalues are, are spreading Yes. For different uh, sizes of the uh, uh, wavekind. Yes. In some sense. So, uh, is there sufficient data to do some sort of scaling to see how it looks like alpha increases when the size of the wavekind becomes smaller? Uh, okay. 
uh, well, we directly we didn't see any possibility for the scaling, uh, but maybe what uh, actually Professor Shapiro said, maybe this, we didn't think actually about this possibility, maybe it's just when we take alpha as a very large parameter, maybe the Simpsons of Maxwell's equations can be amenable to some analytical considerations. This uh, should be looked at because we, we didn't think about this. Uh -huh. But he found this extension where you could bring it, where you could get uh, into the broken phase. Okay, maybe some counterpart of that is possible. It's difficult to say. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is something which should be considered immediately. It's very difficult to give a direct answer to this. Yeah. There was another question, I think. Yeah. Well, you are right, of course. Uh, we <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay, May <coughs> maybe <laughs> this, of course, this is another physical limitation which we definitely did not consider, but I guess it's nevertheless interesting to look at even in that sense formally the results which the Maxwell's equations produce here if you, do, if you ignore the possibility of burning this setting. Okay, you, you are right, of course, is that I should say that we did not look at this uh, limitation, that the system will not start to, to burn. Okay, but uh, <laughs> as I said, I guess it's still interesting to look at what the Maxwell's equations predict, so to say, in the pure form. So this is the Middle East, and you should avoid pyromanic. <laughs> 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 okay, let's take them. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Can you turn on the AC? I'm sleeping. What? 